Before we come to Prime Minister's questions, I would like to point out that the British Sign Language Interpretation of Proceedings is available to watch on ParliamentLive.tv. So we now start with Sir Robert Neill. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I know that the Prime Minister will report later in more... There's been away a long time. Question one. Try again. Mr Speaker, it's only 15 years in my case. <laughs> the another 18. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Today marks five days since the murder of our friend and colleague Joe Cox. My thoughts, and I'm sure those of the whole House, are with her family and friends. Mr Speaker, I'm sure that the House will wish to join me in offering our thanks and best wishes to Sir Roy Stone, who is leaving the Government Chief Whip's office and the Civil Service. He's worked for 13 Chief Whips and for over 20 years has played an invaluable role in delivering the Government of the Day's legislative programme. We wish him well. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Sir Robert Neil. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm sure we would all wish to associate ourselves with the Prime Minister's remarks in relation both to Joe Cox and uh, Roy Stone. Uh, The Prime Minister, I know, will report later to the House in more detail uh, on the G7 summit, which I know President Biden described as extremely uh, collaborative and successful. Uh, In taking forward the agenda, and in particular that part of the agenda of the summit, which calls for us to work to uphold the rule of law uh, and respect for an international rules-based system, will he bear in mind and task all parts of government to promote the great asset that we have in English common law uh, and in the expertise and reputation for integrity of our judiciary and legal systems. Will he make sure that those willing assets are harnessed in the pursuit of that G7 agenda, be it through writing commercial contracts with English law as a jurisdiction or helping through our expertise developing countries and markets? Prime Minister. I thank my uh, my right honourable friend for his question. He raises a very important and vital sector of our economy, our legal services industry, and our judicial system, which is admired around the world. One of the reasons uh, that we're capable of attracting so much inward investment into this country, Mr. Speaker, but also one of the key exports, uh, Mr. uh, Mr. Speaker, that we've been able to promote just recently. Thanks, for instance, to our free trade deal with Australia. We now come to the leader of the opposition, Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I join with the Prime Minister's remarks in relation to Sir Roy Stone? This week also marks the fourth anniversary of the Grenfell fire tragedy, where 72 people lost their lives. It's frankly an outrage that there are still more than 200 high-rise flats with Grenfell-style cladding, and many leaseholders are trapped in homes that are neither safe nor sellable. The best way to mark this tragedy is not with words, but with action, and I urge the Prime Minister finally to end the cladding scandal. Mr Speaker, as the Prime Minister has already said, today is the fifth anniversary of the death of our dear friend and colleague Joe Cox. Joe had already changed so many lives for the better. She was passionate about creating a fairer, more just world. I know she would have gone on to achieve so much more and that she would have been so proud of the work of her foundation and what it's doing in her name. Jo and I were in the same intake into this house. We were friends and our children are around the same age. And there's not a day that goes by when we don't miss Jo. And I know I speak not just for these benches, but for many across the house, when I say that today we remember Jo. Mr Speaker, does the Prime Minister recognise that his decision to keep our borders open contributed to the spread of the Delta variant in this country. Prime Minister. Uh, no, Mr Speaker. I think that uh, Captain Hindsight needs to adjust his retro, his retro spectroscope because he's completely wrong. Uh, uh, we put India, we put India on the red list, Mr Speaker, on April on April the 23rd, uh, and the Delta variant was not uh, so identified until April uh, the 28th, uh, Mr Speaker, and was only identified as a variant of concern on May the 7th, uh, Mr Speaker. When he criticises this government for wanting to keep our borders open, just remember that he voted 43 times in the last five years, Mr Speaker, to ensure that our border controls were kept in the hands of Brussels, Mr Speaker. Keir Starmer. 
Mr Speaker, this is absurd. I have, on seven occasions at PMQs, raised the question of the borders with the Prime Minister. They're all marked up in the transcript. They're all there in Hansard, uh, Prime Minister. Time for a better defence. Your defence is as bad as your border policy. And Mr Speaker, this is the, the Prime Minister talks about the dates. Let's go through the dates. On March the 24th, a new variant was reported in India. On the 1st of April, India was reporting that over 100,000 new infections were rising a day and rising. But the Prime Minister kept India off the red list until the 23rd of April. In that time, 20,000 people came into the UK from India. What on earth did the Prime Minister expect would be the consequences of that? The British people did their bit by following the rules and getting vaccinated. But the Prime Minister squandered it by letting a new variant into the country. That was not inevitable. It was the consequence of his indecision. If the Prime Minister disagrees with me, and he answered the first question, no, what is his explanation as to why Britain has such high rates of the Delta variation? What's his explanation? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, there's a very simple reason why the UK generally has a better understanding of the variants in this country. So that's because uh, we do 47% of the genomic testing anywhere in, in the world, uh, Mr Speaker. And uh, I, I really think that he should get his, his facts straight, because uh, the, the Delta variant, as I've said, was identified uh, in this country on uh, April the 28th. He, and, and I have a, a document on which I believe the uh, Leader of the Opposition is, is relying, Mr Speaker, in which he says that the Delta variant, it, it, it seems to be published by someone called David Evans, uh, of General Secretary of the Labour Party, uh, saying that the Delta variant was identified on April the 1st, Mr Speaker. He says B1617 uh, was des designated under investigation on April the 1st, uh, the Delta variant. Mr Speaker, that is not the Delta variant. That is the Kappa variant, Mr Speaker. It's a, it's a gamma, uh, Mr Speaker, for the Labour Party. There's a difference. The Delta variant, as it happens, is, is seeded around the world in 74 countries and um, sadly is growing. But there's a difference between those countries and this country, Mr Speaker. In this country, we've vaccinated almost 79% of the adult population and given two vaccinations to 56%, uh, a programme that he would have stopped, Mr Speaker, by keeping us in the European Medicines Agency. Yes, Dharma. The, 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 the question was, what's his explanation for our high rates of the Delta variant? Answer, there came none, other than apparently we understand the variant. The data is very, very clear. Our NHS, our NHS has been doing an amazing job with the vaccine rollout. But while the NHS was vaccinating, he was vacillating. It's because of his indecision that our borders stayed open. It's because of his indecision that India stayed off the red list. It's because of his indecision that in that period 20,000 people came to this country from India. Mr Speaker, the consequences are now clear. The rate of the Delta variant is much higher here than in other countries. And we learn today that, tragically, once again, the UK has the highest infection rate in Europe. We did not want to top that table again. Mr Speaker, if his borders policy is so strong, how does the Prime Minister explain that? Mr Speaker, I think for, for, for the ease of the House, he should begin by pulping uh, his document in which he incorrectly identifies uh, what the Delta variant, uh, what the Delta variant is. Uh, which, uh, and, uh, Mr Speaker, we took uh, the most drastic steps possible to put India on the uh, red list on April the 23rd before that variant was even identified. And the, the big difference between this country and the rest of Europe, he loves these uh, comparisons, uh, Mr Speaker, it shows his, his instincts, but the big difference is that we've had the fastest vaccine rollout anywhere in Europe. Uh, we have a very, very high degree of protection, and it's thanks to the vaccine rollout, thanks to the fantastic efforts of the NHS, that we have now, and we can continue, with one of the most open economies and societies in Europe and get on and get on with our cautious but irreversible roadmap to freedom, Mr Speaker. Yes, Mr Speaker, if the Prime Minister put as much effort into protecting our borders as he does coming up with ridiculous excuses, the country would be reopening next week. But even now, what do we know? The Delta variant is responsible for 90% of infections in this country. He's persisting with a traffic light system that doesn't work and won't stop other variants coming in. 
Mr Speaker, after so many mistakes, and with the stakes so high, why doesn't the Prime Minister do what Labour is calling for, drop the traffic light system, get rid of the amber list, secure the borders, and do everything possible to save the British summer? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, he doesn't even know what the Delta variant is, uh, and, he, and, and, he, and uh, we, have the toughest, we have the toughest border measures anywhere in the world, and we will, we will continue. Uh, we, have 50 countries on the, we have 50 countries on the red list, Mr Speaker, and if he's now saying, if he's now saying uh, that he wants to stop all, transi- all traffic, all travel to and from this country, uh, then it's yet another flip-flop uh, from the Labour leader of the opposition, yet another, yet, yet another totally unintelligible flip-flop, Mr Speaker. If he wants to, if he wants to close this country down uh, to travel, which is what I understood him uh, to be saying, uh, then it's not only an, a, a yet another flip-flop, but it's also totally pointless, because we have 75% of our medicines and 50% of our food that comes in from abroad, Mr Speaker. He's got to, he's got to adopt a consistent position. Kirstama. Mr Speaker, what I've learned, the worse the position for the Prime Minister, the more pathetic he gets. Is he really suggesting, is he really suggesting that the 20,000 people who came in from India were bringing in vital medical supplies or food? It's ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. What we were arguing for is for India to be on the red list between the 1st and the 23rd of April. If that had happened, we wouldn't have the Delta variant here. And it's as simple as that. The Prime Minister's former senior adviser got it absolutely right. He said, and I quote, fundamentally there was no proper border policy because the Prime Minister never wanted a proper border policy. The man who was in the room. And it's those in hospitality, in clubs, in pubs, the arts, tourism and travel who are paying the price of the Prime Minister's failure. All they ask is that they, if they have to keep their businesses closed, they get the support that they need. But where is it? Business rate relief is being withdrawn from the end of this month, affecting 750,000 businesses. Furlough is being phased out. Mr Speaker, in Wales, the Labour government has acted by extending business rate relief for a year and providing new support for those affected. When is the Prime Minister going to do the same for businesses in England? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, we're proud of the support we've given to businesses up and down the country and the whole point about the cautious approach uh, that we are taking is to continue support b- both with furlough and with uh, support through business rates, through uh, grants of up to £18,000, uh, the support from councils, uh, all of that is, is continuing. But what we're also seeing is uh, we're seeing businesses slowly uh, recovering and the growth in the economy in April was 2.3%. Uh, card spending over the bank holiday weekend was actually 20% above uh, pre-pandemic levels, Mr Speaker. I know how tough things have been and we will look after business throughout this pandemic. But thanks to the vaccine rollout, thanks to the cautious steps uh, we are taking, we are seeing a shot in the arm for business across the country and we will look after them all the way. Speaker, yes again, it's not what the government has done, it's what's needed now in light of the decision that was taken this week. Hospitality UK says the sector will lose £3 billion because of the delay and that 200,000 jobs could be at risk. That's not what has been done, it's what's needed now, Prime Minister. And the Federation of Small Businesses warns the government is being dangerously complacent. I think we've just seen an example of that. Mr Speaker, we all want these restrictions to be over, for our economy to be open for businesses to thrive, but the Prime Minister's indecision at the borders has blown it. And and the problem with with everything the Prime Minister says today, both what he says at the dispatch box and also what he mutters, um, is that we've heard it all before so many times. Last, Last month, March, he said we could turn the tide in 12 weeks, remember that? Then he said it will all be over by Christmas. Then we were told June 21st would be Freedom Day. Now we're told July 19th is Terminus Day. The British people don't expect miracles, but they do expect basic competence and honesty. And when it comes to care homes, protective equipment or borders, we see the same pattern from this Prime Minister. Too slow, too indecisive, over-promising, under-delivering. After all these failures and mistakes, why should anyone believe the Prime Minister now? Mr Speaker, why should anybody believe the Leader of the Opposition uh, when he can't 
uh, when he can't, he can't decide what he thinks from one week to the next. He says he has a, a tough position on borders. Actually, he was attacking uh, quarantine uh, only recently and saying, and saying that it was a blunt instrument that should be lessened, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, what I think the people of this country want to see is a government getting on with the vaccine rollout and getting on uh, with our caution of the irreversible roadmap to freedom. I am very pleased, and he, I, I, he should say it again, uh, that we have one of the fastest vaccine rollouts anywhere in the world, certainly the fastest in Europe. It would not have been possible if we'd stayed in the EMA. We would not have been able to control our borders if, uh, as he voted for 43 times, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, we'd stayed in the, in the EU. Uh, we're getting on uh, with the job. We're bringing forward now 23, 24-year-olds uh, for asking them to come forward for their vaccines. I ask everybody to come forward uh, for their second jab. I trust uh, he has had his, Mr Speaker, and we are delivering on our commitments uh, to the British people. Not only a, a, a great outcome at the G7 summit uh, this last weekend in Carbis Bay, but a new free trade agreement uh, with Australia and a building back better across our country. We're getting on uh, with the job, Mr Speaker, and it would be, it would be a wonderful thing uh, once in his uh, time as Leader of the Opposition to hear some support uh, for what the government is doing uh, and, 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 and some backing up uh, for our approach. Bob Rister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last year, doctors and care settings issued an unprecedented number of do not resuscitate orders to patients with learning disabilities and mental illness. Many were unlawful and caused avoidable deaths. Despite urgent CQC and NHS guidance, shockingly, this practice has continued. Last week, The Telegraph reported that Sonia Delion died unresuscitated. Her family said she was given a DNR without them knowing, and with her learning disabilities and schizophrenia stated as reasons. Does the Prime Minister share my alarm about these cases, which should have no place in our care, and does he agree that they should be independently investigated? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I, th I thank my honourable friend for raising this, this very sad case with me, and I'm sure the whole House uh, will be thinking of Sonia de Leon and her family. I think that such uh, decisions on uh, do not attempt, uh, do, uh, do, uh, do not resuscitate, uh, sh uh, should be made only uh, in accordance with uh, a decision uh, involving the person concerned and their carers and their families, Mr Speaker. Let we now come to the SNP leader, Ian Blackford. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I associate myself with the remarks that you made, the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition, and the absolutely brutal death of our friend and colleague, Joe Cox, five years ago, a woman that was dedicated to public service, that made in her short time here a tremendous contribution to this House, and our thoughts are very much with her family, her friends, and all those that uh, care very deeply for her loss. And of course, as we do that, we should also reflect on what we saw earlier this week with the journalist Nick Watt chased through the streets yeah. of Whitehall by a mob seeking to intimidate. And we must all stand up in this House for the rights of journalists to be able to go around their work safely. May I say, uh, Mr Speaker, good wishes both to Scotland and England ahead of the football match on Friday evening. But if I, if I, if I may say so, I do hope that uh, we don't see Scotland being dragged out of the Euros uh, against our wishes at the end of the week. Uh, Mr Speaker, as we, as, we, as we enter the chamber, we see what is reported to be WhatsApp communication between the Prime Minister and Dominic Cummings, and perhaps the Prime Minister will clarify whether or not these are genuine and whether the derogatory comments that he expressed on his Health Secretary are valid or not. Mr Speaker, this morning... The details of the disastrous trade deal with Australia are slowly seeping out. It tells us everything that we need to know, that these details are being celebrated in Canberra, but they're busy being concealed in London. For all the spin, it's clear that this Tory government has just thrown Scottish farmers and crofters under their Brexit bus, just as they sold out our fishing community. So today, those with most to lose from this deal don't need to hear the Prime Minister's usual waffle. Their livelihoods are at stake, Prime Minister. Just this once, just this once, they deserve honest answers from this government. Can the Prime Minister confirm that from day one of this deal, 35,000 tonnes of Australian beef and 25,000 tonnes of Australian lamb will be free to flood the UK market tariff-free? 
Minister. Mr Speaker, this is a great deal for uh, the UK, it's a great deal for Scotland, uh, it's a great deal for Scottish whisky, it's a great deal for Scottish uh, business and, and services export, it's a great deal for Scottish legal services, but it's also a great deal for Scottish farming. And how tragic, how absolutely tragic that it should be the posture of the, uh, of the uh, Scottish National Party, Mr Speaker, uh, to see absolutely no way in which uh, Scottish farmers uh, could be uh, able to take advantage of the opportunity to export around the world. What he really doesn't realise is there already are £350 million worth of UK food going from uh, this country uh, to Australia. This is an opportunity to turbocharge uh, those exports, to get behind uh, Scottish farming and encourage them, Mr Speaker, not run them down. Ian Blackford. My goodness, I don't even think the Prime Minister can believe that tripe. Mr Speaker, in the Tories' desperation to get a post-Brexit trade deal with somebody, with anybody, they've given the farm away, literally. It is blindingly obvious who the winners and who are the losers in this deal. Australia's economy will benefit to the tune of $1.3 billion a year. The UK government's own assessment says that the Australian deal is worth just, and I quote, zero. 0.02% of GDP. Mr Speaker, you would need 200 Australian deals to come close to mitigating the cost of Brexit. We were told that Brexit was all about taking back control. But for our farmers and for our crofters, there has been no scrutiny, there has been no consultation and there has been no consent. So if the Prime Minister is really confident about the benefits of this deal. Does he have the guts to put it to a vote in this House? Mr Speaker, the the people of this country voted uh, for this government to get on and deliver free trade deals around the world. And uh, I believe they were totally right. Uh, He talks about about tripe, Mr Speaker. Well, I can tell him uh, that when it comes to exporting the intestines of, uh, of sheep, uh, which I know is a, valu- a valuable part of Scottish uh, tradition. E- even that uh, is now being opened up around the world, thanks to the deals that this country is doing. And, uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, if, if, he, if he is saying, if he is saying uh, that he wants to go back uh, into the EU, hand back control of our fisheries, hand back control of our agriculture to Brussels, uh, lose all the opportunities that this country has gained, I think he is frankly out of his mind and, and going in totally the wrong direction. And if he means an, a referendum, another referendum, Mr. Speaker, we had one of those. Can, can I just say gently to everybody, we need no need to turbocharge questions and answers. Lord Lord. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thanks to our unique geography, the High Peak has some of the worst broadband and mobile coverage gaps anywhere in the country. We are making good progress, but can I urge the Prime Minister to redouble efforts in the rollout of ultra-fast broadband, to, especially to hard-to-reach rural areas like the High Peak? And can I suggest that the government builds on the success of the Kickstart scheme with more focused support <coughs> for key infrastructure industries so that we can recruit a new generation of highly skilled broadband engineers to turbocharge the rollout? Yes. Prime Minister. <laughs> I thank my honourable friend, but my honourable friend, he's, he's absolutely right, and uh, that's why we're working with industry to accelerate our uh, rural network and uh, coverage across the whole of the UK has massively increased and will be increasing thanks to the steps that we're taking. Sir Geoffrey Dons. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know, like me, the Prime Minister cares passionately about the union. Can the Prime Minister therefore confirm that the passing of the EU Withdrawal Act? and the Northern Ireland Protocol that forms part of it has not resulted in an implied repeal of Article 6 of the Act of Union, which enables Northern Ireland to trade freely with the rest of this United Kingdom? And will he commit to fully restoring Northern Ireland's place within the UK internal market? Prime Minister. Uh, Yes, of course, Mr Speaker. I can give assurances on both uh, those counts, and I can say that unless we uh, see Uh, progress on the implementation of the protocol, which I think is currently uh, totally uh, disproportionate, then uh, we will have to take the necessary steps uh, to do exactly what he says. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that the rebuild of Hillingdon Hospital will be a great benefit to his constituents and mine? And will he commit to working with me and other local members of Parliament and potential future MPs like Peter Fleet and Chesham and Amersham to secure the future of services 
at Hillingdon's other site, Mount Vernon, in my constituency, which provides specialist medical treatments to a very wide catchment area. Yes. Prime Minister. Uh, I thank my honourable friend. He's totally right about Hillingdon uh, Hospital, which has a, uh, a great future, and uh, we will make sure, and I look forward to working uh, with him. Uh, and to make sure that the future of services at Mount Vernon uh, is, all, is also uh, protected. And I know that a full consultation is due to start in September. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Kevin, a hotel manager in Oxford, contacted me last week because he's worried. Because even if this country does open up in the next few weeks, he won't be able to run at full capacity due to chronic staff shortages. Local staff are leaving the industry because of the uncertainty caused by this government's bungled handling of this pandemic. The EU staff have already left because of the botched handling of Brexit, and he can't recruit from abroad because of the damaging new immigration policy. This is the Prime Minister's wake-up call. Oxfordshire's economy alone relies on the hospitality industry to the tune of £2.5 billion. Will the government introduce a Covid recovery visa to help Kevin recruit the staff he desperately needs. Yeah. Minister. Mr Speaker, it's absolutely true that as we open up our economy, there, is, uh, a, uh, there are more vacancies, and that's, that's great. Uh, but we also have large numbers of people in this country, Mr Speaker, large numbers of, of young people uh, who need jobs, uh, and large numbers of people who are still furloughed. And I think what we want to see is those people coming forward to get those jobs. But of course, we will, re we will retain uh, an open and a flexible approach towards allowing talent to come in from overseas. Antony Mac. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister knows the full value of the UK shellfish industry and the opportunity potential that there is. This week, the Food Standards Agency produced a list of recommendations that will allow us to regrade our waters, challenge anomalous results. However, those recommendations only come in September this year. Will the Prime Minister flex his muscles and see if the report and the recommendation can be brought forward to the end of this month. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I will do everything I can uh, to ensure that uh, we accelerate this uh, process. He's right to raise it. A great deal of progress has already been made and uh, the Food Standards Agency has, I think, been uh, flexible, but we need to go further and uh, we'll make sure that great British shellfish can continue to be exported uh, to Europe and around the world. Marine Fellows. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The UK government's trade deal with Australia has been made with no consultation, no consent, and no parliamentary scrutiny. The President of the National Farmers Union of Scotland has said our seafood industry has already been hit hard by Brexit, and now Scottish farming will be sacrificed. Again, it's Scotland's key industries which will bear the brunt of a Tory Brexit people in Scotland did not vote for. Does the Prime Minister think these concerns from NFU Scotland President, and does he accept them, or does he think that he knows better? Minister. Mr Speaker, you would think from listening to the SNP that there, were, there was no uh, Scotch whisky industry or no banking and financial services industries uh, in, in Scotland. But even then, uh, they're missing the point because this is a massive opportunity for the Scottish agriculture sector. And what they need, what they need is a different type of MP, uh, Mr Speaker, who can champion them, who can get behind them, who actually believes in Scotland, uh, Mr Speaker. That's what the people of Scotland need. Thank you, Mr Speaker. One of the reasons for the popularity of the Prime Minister is that he's always been on the side, he's always been on the side of the public rather than on the side of the establishment. Given that, overall, given that overall deaths in the UK over the last 13 weeks are 8,873 below the five-year average, which includes the time the Indian variant has been around, can my right honourable friend explain why Instead of trusting his world-leading vaccine programme, the common sense of the British people and his conservative instincts of individual freedom and individual responsibility, he instead prefers to trust people like Professor Susan Mickey at SAGE, a long-standing member of the Communist Party, who last week let the cat out of the bag and said she wanted some Covid restrictions to last forever. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, nobody, uh, uh, least of all uh, I or uh, my honourable friend, want to see Covid restrictions uh, last forever, nor do I think that they are uh, going to last uh, forever, Mr Speaker. As I made clear earlier this week, I think we can have a high degree of confidence that our, program, our vaccination programme will work, and I think we need to give it a little bit 
uh, more time, as I've explained, uh, to save many thousands more lives by vaccinating millions more people. That's what we want to do. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My constituent Ross has been invited to sit his driving theory test in Oban, 100 miles away from his home in Hamilton. His test has already been cancelled twice, first in November last year and then February 2021. This September, Ross is starting a university course in paramedic science with a view to becoming a qualified paramedic in the Scottish Ambulance Service with placements across Scotland. Being able to drive is crucial. Will the Prime Minister meet with me to discuss the delays in the scheduling of DVSA theory tests and the impracticality of the locations being offered? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, Prime Minister. I, I, I thank the Honourable Lady. I, I am aware of the, of the problem and we are doing what we can to accelerate uh, the number of, uh, of driving instructors and testers so uh, to allow young people such as the, uh, the, the gentleman she mentions to get their, their driving test done uh, and enable them to fulfil their, their ambitions. Mr Speaker, I support uh, the Prime Minister's comments on Joe Cox and also, as uh, a former Chief Whip, his comment on Sarai Stone. Sarai gave amazing service to me as Chief Whip during the worst of the Brexit years in dealing with the hung parliament and with the odd occasional disruptive Backbencher. <laughs> Mr Speaker, um, Northern Ireland faces some challenges uh, over the coming weeks in terms of nominating a first and deputy first minister. Uh, would the Prime Minister agree with me that it's vital uh, that uh, parties stick to the agreements that have been made, the new decade, new approach which he and I negotiated 18 months ago, uh, and that in failing uh, to do that, uh, we ultimately, and I know he doesn't like this concept, that the UK Government does act as a backstop? Yes. Prime Minister. Uh, I, I, well, Mr Speaker, it gives, gives me great pleasure to thank uh, my right honourable friend for all the work that he did in the new decade, new approach uh, deal. Uh, and uh, I, I do agree that uh, it will be a good thing for the whole package to be uh, agreed. And I, and, and, and I certainly support the approach that he, uh, that he set out. And I think that what the, the people in Northern Ireland want is a, is a stable, functioning and mature executive. Kenny McCaskill. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A new Lord Advocate is taking up position, but the structural flaws in the office remain. In no other legal jurisdiction in the UK, or indeed in the Western world, is the government's senior legal adviser simultaneously the country's chief prosecutor. Yet the role is enshrined in the Scotland Act 1988. Will the Prime Minister commit to changes so that this historical anachronism can be changed and a separation of powers be achieved? Prime Minister. Uh, well, uh, first of all, Mr. Speaker, I congratulate the uh, Honourable Gentleman on, on, his, on the outstanding success of his party in the recent uh, elections. Uh, but uh, I, will, I will study the anomaly that he, uh, he raises and, re and revert to him uh, as soon as possible. Ruth Abbott. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I welcome the publication of the Tigger report today, um, published by my right honourable friend for Chingford and Woodford Green, my right honourable friend for Chipping Barnet, and my honourable friend for Mid Norfolk. The report makes recommendations about how to seize new opportunities from Brexit and back startups and new tech. Will my right honourable friend look closely at that report so that we can make the most of the great benefits of Brexit and lead the world in the development of new technologies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, Mr Speaker, I thank my uh, honourable and right honourable friends for their excellent report and I think it's time to, to put a tigger in the tank. Ellen Hayes. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I associate myself with the remarks concerning the fifth anniversary of the murder of Joe Cox? Joe is a dear personal friend and colleague who will always be missed and remembered and whose extraordinary legacy endures far beyond this place. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, last month a fire in an East London block of flats caused three people to be hospitalised and dozens more to be treated for smoke inhalation. That block was one of more than 200 high-rise buildings in England, still fitted with Grenfell-style cladding. I asked the Prime Minister, why is it that four years after the Grenfell tragedy took 72 lives, after all the warnings, all the tireless campaigning and the unspeakable injustice, people are still living in unsafe flats and his government has failed to end the cladding scandal. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Minister. Speaker, we have invested massively in removing cladding from, uh, from high-rise blocks. We'll continue to do so. I know the, bill, the, the structure in question, uh, the, the Ballymore, the company concerned, I, I do believe were uh, are too slow and we are on their case, Mr Speaker. But I think it is very, very important 
uh, very, very important, uh, that people understand that overall risks of death by fire have been coming down for a very long time and will continue to come down. And it is simply not the case that all the high-rise buildings in this country are unsafe. And it's very important that members of Parliament should stress that. Paul Holmes. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Independent lifeboat stations like the Hamble lifeboat in my constituency respond to over 100 incidents a year in the Solent. The pandemic has increased the operating costs of independent lifeboat stations while also restricting their ability to raise money. Will the Prime Minister to look, look to see to what more the Government can do to support independent lifeboat stations like the Hamble lifeboat as they keep a watchful eye on all of us? Yes. Prime Minister. Uh, yes, indeed, Mr Speaker. I thank my honourable friend uh, for raising the excellent work of Hamble uh, lifeboats and uh, with the, my, in April last year, uh, my right on for the Chancellor put forward another £750 million in support of uh, charities such as the one he mentions. Sure, Martin, Martin. Mr Speaker, at two venues in Glasgow, hospitality venues called Blue Dog and Adlib, staff there have had no furlough payments since the summer of last year. Having raised this with HMRC directly, the situation still hasn't moved forward. If I send him the details, will he knock heads together help the staff whose bills are going unpaid and debts are rising and get the cash into their accounts they're entitled to. So we'll be very happy to look at it, Mr Speaker. Liam Lang. Um, when can we expect the coordinated chorus of SAGE members recommencing their media appearances to depress Burrell? And does my right honourable friend fear having to give another press conference at which he again postpones the return of our freedoms? Mr Speaker, we are rightly told that we need to learn to live with COVID. So what can the Prime Minister say to the country to convince us of that reality? Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I believe that academic and scientific freedom are an invaluable part of our, uh, our country. Uh, and uh, I, also, I also note that uh, my scientific colleagues would echo uh, my sentiments that we need to learn to live with COVID, Mr Speaker. Sue Macdonald. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This government's two-child cap and its childcare proof-of-payment rules mean my hard-working constituent, Miss Cowan, who's a single parent on universal credit supporting four kids, faces £1,000 of nursery arrears. She's therefore at risk of losing their nursery places. She would therefore have to give up work and would therefore be at risk of sanction and forced further into debt and poverty. Can the Prime Minister help my constituent out of this trap and really fix these rules that are pushing people out of work and into poverty? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I'll be happy to study the case, but the whole point of universal credit, uh, which this government introduces, it's helping uh, hundreds of thousands of people into work, it's a, and, and that is its success. Jason McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I associate myself with the comments of the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition about our friend Joe Cox. Will the Prime Minister join me in congratulating rugby league legend Kevin Sinfield for his OBE in the Queen's Birthday Honours? Yeah. Kevin has done so much to raise awareness of motor neurone disease and support his good friend Rob Burrow. MND is a devastating uh, disease. There's no cure, but scientists, Mr Speaker, believe they're on the cusp of developing effective treatments. So will the government please commit to investing £50 million over five years to establish a virtual MND research institute and accelerate research? I must totally agree with that. It should have been a night. Come on, well, thank you. And it's an OBE, Mr. Speaker. I also thank uh, Kevin Fitzinville uh, very much for his outstanding work and uh, we're following it up uh, with uh, we're spending £55 uh, million pounds on research into, into MND, but there will be more to come uh, as part of our general massive investment in, in life sciences. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The trade deal the Prime Minister has struck, simply put, means undercutting our farmers, mm -hmm. shortchanging consumers, mm -hmm. and it will set animal welfare standards mm -hmm. back by decades. Mm -hmm. yep. The RSPCA have said that the Prime Minister's deal will, and I quote, start a race to the bottom mm -hmm. and the losers will be mm -hmm. billions of farmed animals and UK farmers. Does the Prime Minister accept these concerns from the experts at the RSPCA, or does he think that he knows better? Prime Minister. I really think that these constant attacks on Australia and their standards and their animal welfare standards would be very, very much resented by the people of Australia and they, would be, they not, would not be recognised. Actually, Australia is marked five out of five, which is the highest possible, by the World Organisation of Animal Health Performance and Veterinary Services Evaluation Team for Animal Welfare. And uh, this deal, Mr Speaker, that we've done is the first ever to incorporate high animal welfare standards as part of the package that Australia has agreed. Lucy Allen. 
Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will my right honourable friend join me in paying tribute to assisted dying campaigner Noel Conway, who has died after taking the decision to have his breathing support removed? And does my right honourable friend agree that it is now time for Parliament to properly consider the law on assisted dying? Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I believe this is a subject on which there are, and I thank uh, my, my honourable friend, uh, and I, I know that the whole House will be in sympathy with Noel Conway's family and Friends, uh, the, there are very, very deeply and sincerely held views on both sides of this matter, uh, and a change uh, in the law would be one, obviously, for Parliament to consider. Owen Thompson. Yes. Mr. Speaker, over the course of this question session, the Prime Minister has been presented with the views of, of stakeholder after stakeholder expressing real fears and concerns over these bungled trade talks. Why is the Prime Minister willing to put the livelihoods of farmers and crofters across Scotland in peril for a shoddy trade deal with Australia that won't even cover 1% of the lost opportunities to Europe's markets that we've lost through Brexit? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, we haven't lost opportunities to Europe's markets through Brexit. Final question, Ben Spencer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In 2014, Runnymede and Weybridge was hit by devastating floods. My constituents live under the fear of flooding. Last week, the Government signed off the outline business case for the River Thames Flood Alleviation Scheme, which will allow the detailed design and planning for this scheme to begin in earnest. It's fantastic news, a monumental milestone, will massively improve our protection from flooding. Will the Prime Minister join me in celebrating, thanking everyone who's got to this point and where we are, and agreeing with me we need to keep the momentum going? Minister. I thank my honourable friend, he's completely right, and the, uh, the uh, £501 million River Thames Scheme. Uh, will pr- reduce the flood risk uh, for 11,000 homes and 16,000 uh, businesses, and I thank him uh, for raising it with me today.